Welcome everyone to the Comics Cube. We're go we're live with the one and only Josie Campbell to talk about my adventures with Superman. How are you? Ooh, I'm good. How are you doing? <laughs> uh, uh, of course, this is the second time you've been on the show. The last time you were on the show, we talked about Shazam, Mary Marvel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like there are some similarities to those two projects that we can talk about. Yeah, yeah. I'm just yeah. going through superheroes with S in their name and super strength, like just <laughs> making my way down the list. <laughs> jo Josie, I so this uh, this ran for 10 episodes, season one. Mm -hmm. It has been renewed for season two. Congratulations. It's currently in production. That was quick. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so mm -hmm. I assume that means the reception has been really good. Yeah, no, I mean, and also like we did get picked up originally when we pitched it uh, for two seasons. Uh, so, you know, we're in production right now in season two, uh, but like it was sort of always the plan to sort of divide up our two seasons, sort of 10 episodes, 10 episodes. Uh, so, you know, we're, we're, we're working on that. Don't know when, uh, like they have not uh, announced yet when that will be coming out so i guess keep keep your ears and eyes peeled for that announcement like it'll be we'll make a big deal out of it when it is announced so everybody knows when to tune back in and uh, watch clark and lois flirt some more that seems to be you know i was on youtube looking up what people were posting on uh on mm -hmm. the show and people mm -hmm. love all the flirting yeah yeah <laughs> i mean we pitched this as a rom-com with punching and i feel like we've lived up to both parts of that pitch <laughs> there's a whole lot of both it is a love letter from uh to superman and actually the whole dc universe i'm a huge starman fan and i never thought kyle the mist yes <laughs> <laughs> kyle yeah, yeah yeah kyle nimbus yeah coming on in and yeah <laughs> i was like what is that I was like, that's got to be a new character. That can't be Kyle. Mm -hmm. No, no, it is Kyle. I can't believe it. Yeah. So, uh, so that's great. But I got to admit, Josie, so coming clean, first two episodes, it was, you know, it, it aired as one thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. After the first two episodes, I got to say, I didn't think it was for me. I was, mm -hmm. you know, I'm a 41 year old, longtime Superman fan. I think Superman fans tend to be very reverential and think mm -hmm. that there's only one correct view of Superman. Mm -hmm. Two more episodes later with the one with Ivo and I was like, oh, this is the greatest cartoon ever. <laughs> awesome. I'm glad we got you past that initial hump. <laughs> uh, what do you did? So because of the changes that you made, you know, the the the, the design of the show, um, it, it's nothing like any Superman thing I've ever seen before. Uh, what were what was the impetus for making something so different with a Man of Steel? Um, I think the biggest impetus is the fact that it's different. And this is a character and a property that's been around for like, what, 85 years now, 84 years? Like we just had an anniversary for him. Um, so, you know, part of it and, you know, it's part of why, you know, it's been hard to get another animated Superman show on the air is that there are so many versions of him that a lot of times you're like, people are like, well, I've seen this before. I know this story. I know how this goes. I've seen this character like and, uh, you know, our approach, like we we're big nerds. We're big fans. Like we grew up in the 90s. So those are our touch points. But like, you know, our pitch was like, okay, we want to tweak enough of the lore and enough of the history that it's recognizable, but different um, because that's what excited us. And then, you know, uh, we got the green light largely because a lot of our executives were in the same boat and like Max and Cartoon Network and then Adult Swim and everybody was in the same boat where they're like, we don't want to see like Superman the Animated Series exists and it's great. We don't want to just rehash that. Like if we're going to green light something, we want it to be new. We want it to be different. We want it to feel fresh and modern, even if it is harking back to a very classic Superman. Uh, so yeah, so the impetus for this was we love classic Superman, but the way to sort of bring it to people is to put those twists on it because we agree. Like there is no reason to just, you know, I'm not Bruce Tim, like Brendan and Jake aren't, you know, Bruce Tim either. Like there's not a reason to just rehash a great show we want to bring something new to it. We want to bring a new flavor and we want to bring our own 
influences and her own joys and her own loves to it. Um, and that was a big part of, uh, of making it was how can we do this and make it different than what's come before. And it, 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 is, it is very different. You're talking about how the difficulty of bringing um, Superman onto the screen all, all the time. Why yeah. do you think, so from a completely fanboy question, a business question, <laughs> why do you think yeah. Batman doesn't have the same problem? <laughs> I, you know what it is, I feel like it's like the eternal question of just like, uh, what makes something hit? And like, I think some of it is like, you know, I think some of it is we, we got into this area with Batman, especially in the sort of the 90s, the 80s and 90s, where I think the grittier sort of like Frank Miller inspired version of him hit, and we all liked that. And we got that Bruce Tim version, which is very inspired by that. And it's that film noir. And there's this grittiness to him that like differentiated him in a way, you know, like earlier, we, you know, I love the like 60s Batman, but it's completely different. Like it is like its own thing. So I think like it took a while to like, but like we as a culture are like, this is fun. This is what we like. I think for Superman, like Superman out the gate was popular. People love Superman. Superman was fun. Superman was like funny, like optimistic, like, and then we kind of hit the slew where, you know, people weren't quite sure what to do with him. And I think it's like around the same time that you got Batman sort of rising and Superman sort of falling. And I think what we were trying to do is get back to that optimism and that joy and that faith and that heart. Um, and I, people gravitate towards different things at different times. Like, you know, in, in the nineties, you know, like I was loving the stories where like Superman's getting beaten up by doomsday, which is a very different flavor. Uh, but like, I think now is a time where people really do want that like earnest, like corn fed, like Kansas boy who like knows right from wrong to come in and save us. Like I, whether it's the world around you, whether it's the pandemic we just went through, whether whatever is going on in your life, I think there's like a want for that again in a way that we haven't culturally, at least for America, we haven't needed or wanted in a while. So that's a very long way to also say like, nobody really quite knows why something hits and something doesn't. I just think like the cultural moment for like Superman is coming back, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And people are sick of cynicism maybe. Yeah. Like we, I like, you know, I grew up in the nineties, like it's a lot of cynicism. And I think it like, it's taken us to this point where we're like, you know what? I want somebody who genuinely wants to save the day. <laughs> That's awesome. And also um, another thing about Superman and the designs that you made, the, one of the things that struck me, uh, of course, was number one, you gave Lois short hair, which I feel like yeah. is a, <laughs> is a tribute to the John Byrne era, maybe. Mm, oh yeah. Yeah. It's, it's like John Byrne. And then also, um, a little, like a little Gen Z. Cause like, there's a lot of Gen Zers who have like, like the kind of the short hairs coming back. And then also we kind of based, uh, it a little bit off of somebody we knew who like has that energy, but like, yeah. That, that John Byrne era where she's got the short hair and she's lifting up the like weights herself is like a big, it's a big influence for us. Yeah. This is so <laughs> light, Clark. How are you so big? I know. How are you doing this? Like, this is like, it might as well be like in my closet. I'm like, love her. <laughs> uh, I, so one of the most ridiculous pieces of backlash I saw about the show is that you gave Lois short hair. And I was like, I didn't even realize that was a thing. Girls can have short hair, guys. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, I think with any property that's like 85 years old, people have their favorites and that doesn't always translate to what they see on screen. So, you know, I also, you know, Lois has short hair. She's great though. She's still the same Lois that she's always been like, we get to dial into her vulnerabilities, I think a little bit more, but yeah, at the end of the day, she's still the same Lois Lane who throws herself out of skyscrapers to force Superman to tell her that he's Superman. <laughs> I, I did have a friend who has mentioned that it reminded him of uh, Fleischer Lois Lane. Mm, yeah, Fleischer Lois Lane was a big touch point. Like every short that she's in she's like goodbye Clark I've stolen your like press badge and I've climbed into the trunk of a mafia Osa's like car and I'm taking off now so that was like there's some big Fleischer Lois energy and you know it's part of the reason why in episode seven we say Lois Prime is that Fleischer Lois design is that she's the one who started it all because she's like the adventurer go-getter <laughs> yeah and of course like um it's a high bar to reach but no one is more reckless than Fleischer Lois <laughs> no one no. Fleisch, 
Fleischer Lo and also Fleischer Lois is surprised when Superman shows up, which I find very endearing. She's like, oh, I'm going to go get my story. I guess he's here now saving me from this volcano too. But like, it's yes. like, Fleischer Lois, what are you doing? Like, what are you doing? What are you doing? <laughs> yeah. We ha yeah. We ha I'm just reading a question here. Okay. I'm going to work this question from a, from a, one of our viewers later because it's, it's about, we're going to do spoilers on the show. It's about when, um, when Lois discovers, so we'll we'll get mm, to it later. Awesome. <laughs> um, another thing about the design that I realized is, um, you know, historically speaking, Clark Kent wearing glasses is code for Clark Kent is not desirable. Clark Kent is not handsome. Mm. Superman is. Mm. But then I yeah. think you guys keyed into this is 2023. People with glasses, yeah. like glasses are like not a thing yeah. at this point. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, you know, and I, I do think that goes back to, you know, a little bit the like, uh, you know, sort of uh, Superman that we were introduced to in the 90s, uh, you know, myself, Jake Wyatt, Brendan Claher, like we're inspired by that 78 movie, we're inspired by Burns work in the uh, 80s, 90s, like we're inspired by the sort of stuff that was happening in the early 90s. But like, you know, it's that duality of like, which one is the real one, Clark or Superman, Clark or Superman. And for us, you know, we are in love with Clark Kent. Like, you know, we really like this idea that like he was raised in the heartland by mom and pa. He has these values. He has this life. Like Superman is the suit he puts on, but at the end of the day, he's Clark. And that's the part, and that's the human part of him. And the, the it's, it's, you know, it's the difference between, and you know, both versions have had their heyday of like, here's the version where he's Superman. He's the alien god. Like even 78, which we love, is a little bit more alien god Superman. Like he gets the crystal, he finds out everything. He's being told what his destiny is. And we wanted to go the other direction and be like, okay, this is Clark Kent. He is anxious. <laughs> he is nervous. And when he's nervous, he breaks things. Uh, he, and you know, also big shout out to our, our uh, artists, our designers, especially like Do Hong, who is our lead character designer, Carly Scudieri, who designed a lot of the early characters. But like, man, they made a beautiful Clark Kent. Like, it's like, you know, Superman looks great, but like once Clark puts on the glasses, you're like, what a cutie. He looks so cute. I get that. He's this cute boy next door. <laughs> I remember the first episode came out and every anime fan on my feed <laughs> had like a screenshot of, of Clark wearing, putting, putting on his glasses. And it's like, oh my God, I love him. <laughs> yeah yeah exactly <laughs> um and I, I guess i wanted to ask about that like um was drawing from was drawing from an anime type of style a very conscious choice a very conscious influence because there is a sequence in the second part of the first episode <laughs> that yep. is it's very anime, very, very anime. <laughs> So, you know, and it's something that we've said in other interviews, and I think that like Brendan and Jake have like articulated beautifully. So I'm going to like sort of paraphrase what they've said before. But like for us, I mean, it's, we grew up with anime as like an influence period. Like we grew up in the 90s, like that's when we were getting Dragon Ball Z, Sailor Moon, Cardcaptor Sakura, Pretty Cure, like all of this stuff is coming in from Japan. And in America, at least, it's like, the first time true like you know we had Voltron before we had some things but like the 90s was this explosion of anime hitting American airwaves and for us as kids it was being presented right next to western media uh so we grew up and we grew up into people who are as influenced by an the anime we watched as kids as we were influenced by the western cartoons we watched as kids and so in a lot of ways this is just kind of uh how our generation draws and writes um what we've done at least again here in america is like you know like the artists that we've hired on the show like you know that the way they draw is anime influenced but like now it's kind of their own style it's it's kind of this like style that we and you, we've seen it sort of in other like like there's a little bit of that style in like uh invincible right now like it's it's this yeah. whole generation of kids who grew up on anime and western animation we've combined it and now this is our style and this is our preferred method of saying things obviously we're nerds and we're weebs so there are specific shout outs like for instance the transformation sequence in episode two gonna say. <laughs> which which is absolutely a reference um but like overall like what we are doing is sort of drawing I think our generation's version of like this is what western animation is now and you know like if like to get 
like a tiny bit historical about it. That's kind of always been the case. Like, you know, uh, uh, Asama Tsutsuka, the uh, 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 Astro Boy was influenced by Disney. Like yes. he was drawing those giant eyes because of Disney. And so like, if you try to chart the, like who influenced who, like Japan or America, what you're drawing is a giant circle. It's a circle. Because it's like, we just feed into each other. It's like, okay, it was inspired by Disney. And then his stuff kind of came back. And in the seventies that inspired new artists who are working at like Disney and Warner Brothers and these action cartoons that were then going overseas. And then we're influencing Japan again, which then comes back to us in the nineties. So it's a, it's a, it's, it's an ongoing, we're stealing from each other. <laughs> it, it's best that way, right? It's best that it yeah. cycles back because otherwise you're just going to repeat what's what's been going on. Yeah, 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 exactly. Another thing about the designs that I realized was um, the the nature of the designs enables you to to go back and forth between the dramatic and the comedic. Yes. So the entire episode where Clark is uh, where Lois finds out that Clark is Superman, but he doesn't yeah. know, and he's you know she says like, "Oh, what is this barbell?" Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. I don't think you could get away with that in a Bruce Tim in a Bruce Tim type of yeah. uh, aesthetic. Yeah, no. And I mean, you know, that's that's one of the things that the hat trick that we were trying to pull off is like, it's funny, it's romantic, but also then we get epic because like, you know, the first half of that episode is like, oh, Clark, you're going to get found out, you silly guy. And then the second half is like, oh, shit, Clark almost died. He's got to stop lying to Lois. He didn't stop lying to Lois. Now everything's falling apart. So yeah, but yes, it does let us do that sort of like nice hat trick of like, they're friendly, they're fun, they're funny. But then we have these incredible action sequences. And that one specifically, Brendan, um, our co-EP, Brendan Claher, like did a pass on and like amped it up to a thousand. Like that Deathstroke versus Superman and the robot scene is, is truly some of his finest work. <laughs> uh, and another thing that I wanted to ask, I think um, th on, this, on this end, I'm actually really just interested in, uh, in the flow of the process. You yeah. cast an Asian actress for Lois Lane. Yep. Yep. Uh, and Lois Lane is Asian. Which came yeah. first? Like what? Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> so for us, um, designing the characters came first um, because we spent like we spent about like a. Uh, I spent about two and a half years, and Brendan and Jake started the process before and brought me on. So for them, it was kind of a three-year development process. But like we knew, like there's been versions of Lois that have been Asian before you've got American Alien. Mm -hmm. Like you've got that new um, comic that's out now. There's been versions of Jimmy that's been black before, but we knew that when we came in, we wanted to make a Metropolis that, uh, you know, even though there's Superman feels realistic. And for us, you know, we don't live in a world where there's only one type of person. Like, you know, many of our crew members are people of color or gay or queer like I am, or, you know, like come from various backgrounds or various countries. Like not everybody is from America working on our show. So we wanted a world that reflected that, that reflected reality basically of like Metropolis is the city of tomorrow. And that means it embraces everybody. So we had some designs first. Um, and then when we were casting, it really solidified when we found, you know, like uh, who uh, Lois was when we found Alice Lee, who was just incredible. And like from the get go, oh my God, she's so great. She brings this amazing energy. It's also, it's astonishing because she and Jack, I, Jack Quaid have never met. <laughs> like really? they never, they did not record together because we started recording during the pandemic. So nobody could be together. Um, so then I think they may have met once in passing as one was leaving the studio as the other one's coming in, but like she and Jack have this amazing chemistry to the point where like, I'm shipping them as the actors together. <laughs> like they're so good playing off of each other's voices. And then Ishmael came in and he hit this perfect level of Jimmy is funny. Jimmy's a comedic relief, but also Jimmy has a lot more going on. He is actually the most emotional and mature of the three of them. Yes. So we had those designs. We knew we wanted like a metropolis that looked like our world and our world is diverse. And then when the actors came in, we're like, we've got perfection. These three are Clark, Lois, and Jimmy. Yeah, Jimmy actually reminds me of, borrowing from another cartoon, mm -hmm. Jimmy reminds me of Sokka from <laughs> Avatar, yeah. where you think he's stupid, but he's actually, he might be the smartest of the three of them. Yeah, absolutely. 
well yeah because you know that's the running joke of like everything every conspiracy jimmy every conspiracy theory jimmy has is real he's right jimmy's <laughs> he's right. always right <laughs> i love it i love it um and I gotta say, uh, so I was watching this cartoon with my girlfriend, and mm -hmm. uh, she had, you know, she's not a huge Superman fan, and yeah, I think it is an interesting feeling, me being a huge Superman fan, yeah. knowing what's coming. We're so I'm, <laughs> I'm talking about yeah. the general, yeah. yeah, and at one point she says to me, "Huh, I just now realized he's Asian. Did you <laughs> realize he's Asian?" And I said, "Yeah, yeah I've known from the start." <laughs> And she's like, how did you know? And I'm like, I can't tell you. <laughs> it would spoil it. Um, I can't I can't tell you who he's related to specifically. Yeah, spoiler. Yes, but I think the thing is, where to her it's a surprise. Yeah. To me, I'm held in suspense. And it's such a weird feeling yeah. um, knowing that. It's like, how do you balance that out? Knowing that there are people who know the twists that are coming. Yeah, we basically, we felt like our uh, job was to there's two things to, to like satisfy. And one is if you've never seen the show before, it needs to be a satisfying twist of who he's related to. And if you do know, we need to actually play off the satisfaction of what we know. So here's the episode where we get to play with that. So that's the, you know, spoiler alert, that's the finale, which is, and you know, uh, I, I got, we got to see both reactions. Cause like, you know, when we really originally pitched this, like one person, one of the executives who pitched you really knew Superman and one of them was coming in fresh. And we got the fresh one. They were like, my God, he's he's related to who? Like, oh, that's so big. Um, and so we knew with that final episode, that especially coming off of the two episodes before, which are so big and lore and plot heavy, that like the the best way to go about it is like the people are gonna be surprised, they're gonna be surprised. And like, you know, there's gonna be kids watching, there's gonna be young people or people who've never really been into Superman before watching. So they're gonna be surprised by that. But then we spend the episode playing with that expectation of like, will he figure it out? What do you look like without glasses, Kent? I think I hate you, Kent. Why do you seem familiar, Kent? And that stuff is fun for those who are in the know. Um, so it's, you know, it's trying to be like, well, we have the surprise, but the real fun is once you know who it is, now we get to have fun and games with him. Now we get to like make the jokes and have fun with this reveal. I, I think it's also interesting how at the very end of it, you leave it unclear as to whether or not he's sure he that he knows. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, it's, it's you know, the general is a character that lives off of secrecy and conspiracies. And uh, he's, you know, he he's decided to take, you know, he did not kill Superman. And, but then he also didn't decide to, like, deal with the aftermath, which I think is like him in a nutshell is, you know, he loves Lois. He's doing all of this because he loves his family. He loves Lois but he can't actually emotionally deal with being there for Lois. So of course he'll, he made the right decision, but then he can't follow up on it. And uh, you know, that's, that's, you know, that's a thing that like people who have family in the military or people who have like, like estranged father figures like deal with. Uh, and yeah. it's something that we enjoyed playing with. So you've got the, again, you've got the comedy of him like trying to figure it out, but then you've also got the tragedy of like, even when he's doing the right thing, he's still leaving his daughter behind. Yeah, I think it's also a nice parallel to the type of masculinity that, that Clark exhibits versus the very traditional masculinity that the general yeah. exhibits. Yeah. I think it's that's very interesting. Um, speaking of knowing, of uh, seeing things that are coming, and I know you mm -hmm. can't talk about season two, but Kryptonite has a very specific effect on yeah. Superman. <laughs> he ends up looking like a particular uh, uh, villain from the comics. <laughs> so uh, with our kryptonite, and again, this is like all, all credit to Brendan and to uh, the designers and the design team. Um, like we knew that we wanted our kryptonite to like work faster and be more brutal. Um, and they took this concept of like the, basically the two concepts. And when they showed me, I was like, holy shit was specifically anaphylactic shock, which like as soon as it comes out, he's gasping for air, he's arching his back, he's going into anaphylactic shock, but also this concept of cordyceps, which are fungus, these fungus that like ants get that like grow when they explode out of you, grow in these crystalline formations that are terrifying. 
Um, so I think less doomsday and more like we were trying to go with the body horror stuff of like, mm. all right, he's going in anaphylactic shock. And then the most horrifying thing that the, you know, our designers could think of is this idea of this alien matter bursting out of you and growing on you um, and like encasing you. Uh, and, uh, and then, yeah. And then we looked at the still images. We're like, that's pretty disturbing. Uh, go for it. And then we got back to the episode. We're like, holy shit, this is really disturbing. <laughs> this is great. <laughs> go for it. <laughs> it's great. <laughs> uh, uh, we have a question from Mike Edson, act from Mike Edson from Florida. Uh, we mm -hmm. actually, and guys, if you have any questions, type them in the chat, please. Uh, so I was actually going to ask about this because now I want to talk about something that I didn't see coming which is mm -hmm. that Lois finds out so early mm, and that, yeah. uh, and that Jimmy knows. So Mike <laughs> yeah. said, I naturally assumed Lois nor Jimmy would not discover Superman's true identity this season, or that would be a possibility in the finale. Instead, Lois found out early and Jimmy said he always knew. In the same vein, I wasn't expecting the romance between Lois and Clark to develop this quickly. It was so positive and delightful to see. What kind of planning goes into pacing out the season and when to subvert expectations in such a way? Can you give any other examples of debates in the writer's room about when to reveal things to the audience or to Lois and Jimmy? Yeah, so I mean, basically there's two things going on there um, and one is creative and then one is very practical. And the very practical version is, we knew we only had 10 episodes for this first season. Um, and we knew that there is a chance that maybe we won't get any more. Um, so in some, some cases, some of the things, like if we had more episodes, I think we would have played some things out a little longer. Um, but then that's the creative side coming in, which is, you know, again, like we've seen the version where Lois never figures it out or Lois only figures it out in the last episode, which is like, a, you know, Superman the Enemy series. We've seen the version where, you know, it takes her a couple of movies to figure it out. And I think for us, one of the things we wanted to do uh, and get to is this idea of her and Jimmy and Clark as a unit um, and doing something that we feel like we haven't seen very much of, which is they're all in on the secret together and they're helping him. Uh, and, you know, we had our fun and games with the episode where it's like, Clark, man, you're such a bad liar. How did nobody else figure this out? But also like, you know, our Lois is smart. She's, she's very smart. Like she, and she is so like dedicated. It just made sense to us that she would figure it out pretty fast. And that this midpoint would be, okay, she's figured it out now. Is he going to come clean? Like, at, like how long can he keep this up for? Um, and, you know, like for us in the writer's room, um, where to pace and put these reveals and what information to reveal is a huge part of how we plot this out. You know, we start every season by doing a giant season arc plot out. Uh, like we did these uh, week long rooms with all of our writers, both staff writers and freelance writers and where we blue skied all of our ideas. And then we kind of put them in order and we're like, okay, what is the most dramatic reveal that we could have? What's the most surprising one? Uh, what things are the audience expecting that like would be fun for us to play with? Like, you know, once Lois knows, there's fun and they like, who me? I'm not Superman. Like there's fun in that episode. Um, and what things do we want to surprise them with? And, you know, sometimes like, you know, you plan things out and people are like, ah, I know who the general is. And you're like, well, yeah, you're at the comics. So we're hopefully you'll enjoy the reveal just because it's a fun episode. But for something like Lois, we're like, yeah, everybody's expecting it to be the end of the season, but we want to press their relationship faster. We want Lois and Superman to be on the same side and for Lois and Jimmy to also feel like they have to protect Clark's identity and help him. And the best way to do that was to be like, Lois figures it out fast. She's smart, she's dedicated, she'd do it. <laughs> my, my, so here's an interesting thing for me is like my biggest plot hole in most Superman uh, uh, versions mm -hmm. is that Lois doesn't figure it out or doesn't figure <laughs> it out fast enough. I, I love, I love post-crisis Superman. It yeah. drives me nuts that she didn't figure it out in that one. I love yeah. All-Star <laughs> Superman. It drives me nuts that she doesn't realize that, she, that he's Superman. And mm -hmm. I buy the whole glasses of this guy, but not for the yeah. greatest investigative reporter in the world. <laughs> the interesting thing is that you've established that in all the multiverse, she's not even the smartest Lois Lane. <laughs> oh no, no. I think she's just the most like tenacious. Like she's she really does not give up. <laughs> um, and you know, like some of that is like it is, you know, the secret identity is a very fun thing to play with. Like as a writer, 
it's fun to be like pull the wool over somebody's eyes. But yeah, for us, like we we wanted we wanted them to be able to be on the same page by the end of the season and to like, you know, to like get rid of that, like sort of like in some ways albatross, like, you know, that's yeah. the that like the thing hanging over her. It's like, when is she gonna figure it out? Well, she figures out fast. And now we get to have fun with a version of Lois and Superman working together that like we rarely see. I definitely thought it was going to happen towards the end of the season. I yeah. didn't expect it to happen midway through the season. And that's a, such a great episode. Uh, like we said, it was comic relief for about half of it. And by the end of it, she's got tears in her eyes and she's screaming yeah. out Clark. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's it, it's amazing. What is the impetus for not have, for not basing a whole thing about uh, Jimmy finding out and just to, he always knew? <laughs> So we, that was also when we went back and forth, but like, I think it was a combination of like, it's the funniest thing that could happen. Just like Jimmy, like nonchalantly being like, oh yeah, I've obviously known. Uh, like, and then also like, we felt like it was, it was a fun character moment for him of like, he, he supports his friend. He cares about Clark the person, not Clark the alien. And, you know, he's so about finding aliens and finding cryptids and the fact that he had this alien in front of him and he's like, well, clearly there's something going on here and I need Clark to feel comfortable to tell me, I think it exemplifies the type of person Jimmy is, that Jimmy was willing to wait for him, that Jimmy knew what was up. And like, you know, it also like starts to explain things of like, why were those pictures so blurry at the beginning and suddenly they're crystal clear once he has the suit, you know, like uh, that Jimmy took of like, you know, like I do think like Jimmy was like wanting Clark to tell them, but like he was much more willing to like wait it out. And that being that sort of like sensitive kind of nurturing presence is like, we felt like something that we loved about our Jimmy and our version of Jimmy is that he's not just the comedic relief, again he's got that emotional maturity and emotional smarts that like lois and clark kind of lack well because one is incredibly impulsive and one is very naive yeah exactly <laughs> and like jimmy kind of is like in a lot of cases the glue holding them together which is very fun for us <laughs> yeah i was gonna ask now that you know you reached a point so obviously as friends jimmy might be the glue that holds them together but mm -hmm. obviously lois and clark uh, are dating, will be dating, uh, will be romantic tension between them. What yeah. is, like, how do you prevent Jimmy in a subplot like that from becoming a third wheel? Mm. Well, you know, the way we handled it this season was for sure, uh, we addressed it. We addressed the fact that like, you know, he, and you know, he, he likes them. They're both his friends. He wants them to get together and maybe stop being so stupid about their feelings for each other. But then, yeah, uh, the fact that he did become a third wheel by that fourth and fifth episode became a thing where like, well, we do have to address it because like, you know, it is a thing that happens in your 20 something relationships. Like, uh, and I feel like that that episode, episode six, where the, everybody's confronting each other, which Angela Ensminger wrote, uh, is so great because it also like sort of exemplifies what else like Jimmy brings to the table, which then we see going on forward, which is, you know, he, he cares about Clark the person. And that third wheel storyline gave us the chance to dig more into Jimmy, which then like as he's moving forward and his stream is taking off and he's seeing all the stuff with Superman, like he's the one rallying the city together and using his platform to save his best friend. So it felt like, you know, for us to make Jimmy not just the third wheel, we needed to dive into like, well, why are he and Clark friends? And we felt like that episode and then moving forward, it's very clear, which is like, you know, Lois is the one pushing Clark to become a hero, but Jimmy is sort of like the one, like who's the safe space for Clark, the, the one who's like supporting him no matter what and gives him the like sort of like bravery and support to be a hero. Um, so yeah. yeah. Let's talk about, you mentioned episode six. So let's talk about my, favorite episode of the entire series which is episode okay. six yes uh, it's just such a so from lois and clark just being really steamy and flirting yeah. <laughs> and fighting, yep yep uh, to to the biggest subversion of expectations i've ever seen with monsieur mala and the brain <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what made mala and the brain what made them the right characters for this particular story for this particular counterpoint so it's it's so funny because yeah like i mean a jimmy gets kidnapped by a lot of gorillas in the comics and like uh there's a lot of gorillas i mean there's obviously the ultra humanite you've got 
you know, uh, uh, you know, Titano, but like for us, and this comes down to like our, our earliest pitch, like honestly, the earliest pitch that Brendan and Jake had had Mr. Mala and the brain in it. And part of it is because we love Mr. Mala and the brain. We're Doom Patrol fans uh, and they're super fun. Part of it was, yes, yeah, subverting the expectation of like, well, you know, we've seen, you know, Titano in a lot of versions. We've seen bits and pieces of the ultra humanite. Like what are, what's somebody who feels that niche that we haven't seen? And then the third part, which is I think what works for this episode so well is they become this stand in, not just for relationships because it's like, they're, you know, they're in love. They clearly have had this long relationship that like, you know, sums back to the comics, but also they are a way for us to talk about the alienness of Clark that, you know, it felt like one of the best parts of the episode, in my opinion, which I really love Angela's writing in here, um, is when we get to the part where, you know, uh, Brain is telling Clark, it's like, you're different like us, come with us, this world, it's not so accepting of that. And like, that was to us what Mr. Mala and the Brain represented is like, you know, maybe if like Clark had never stumbled on them in the woods, they would have lost their minds and started the Brotherhood of Evil. But like, they were people who know what it's like to be hunted. They're people who know what it's like to be deemed wrong or different or weird and uh, targeted for it. And there are people who know how a relationship is supposed to work. So, and then it's funny that a robot with a brain in it and a French super intelligent talking gorilla are like judging Clark and Lois and being like, oh, you're bad friends. Jimmy, this is how this works. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, you know, you mentioned that Monsieur Mala and the Brain have been uh, a romantic couple in the comics yep. for decades. Yep. Yep. Uh, however, I... I don't think I would be wrong in assuming that even 10 years ago, you probably couldn't have done it in Western animation, right? Yeah, we've come a long way for sure. Cause yeah, you know, they've been, yeah, they've been a couple in the comics for, for a long time. Uh, but yeah, I mean, you know, I worked on Shira, like I know firsthand, like there's been a big push to be make like, you know, characters, gay characters, characters who are different, who have, let's be honest, have always existed and have always existed in the comics to finally be like, no, we can put them on screen. Like people like me are excited for that. People in the audience are excited for that. Um, and I think what the a really great thing about our Superman show was is uh, that we really didn't get pushback on that. We didn't get pushback from DC. We mm -hmm. didn't get pushback from Warner Brothers. They were excited for us to use all of these characters and like, uh, you know, uh, they were really excited for us not to do that, but also to like bring in those aspects from the comics that hadn't been touched on, you know, like Mark Curlin was our like sort of DC like liaison executive and he was excited anytime we wanted to use something that was comics based and specifically like kept the comics lore. Um, so yeah, it's, it's been, it's been great. It's been great to see you know, basically the world of animation open up and be accepting of these things that, again, we're being honest, have always been there, are always there. Like Doom Patrol has had gay characters for forever. And it's lovely that we finally get to put them on screen. <laughs> and especially Jamal and the brain. You know, this is yes, a brain and a monkey. A brain and a, a, yeah, a brain and a gorilla who just, are, they're just doing all science together, man. <laughs> uh, Mike Edson asks, uh, I laughed out loud between the uh, over the bickering between the gorilla character and the brain, especially about the mold growing on the dishes and how it was a science experiment. Was any of that ad-libbing or was it all in the script? Uh, yeah, so uh, uh, Jesse and Ocala and Andre uh, Sog Soguili, um, God, I'm ruining his name, uh, Soguilizio, uh, were our two um, uh, brain and Mala. And so we had written up into the script of like, you always like say this, kill this, kill that, like uh, do the addition so there's mold. But after that, that is, it's all ad-libbed. It was all them ad-libbing back and forth. <laughs> Of like being like, oh, when you run out of penicillin, you're going like you can hear that as like Jimmy's walking out, like brain being like, when we run out of penicillin, you're going to thank me for that mold. Like, so yeah, so we had like him being like, eliminate this, eliminate that. And then they just went off. So yeah, that little that little bit right there is all improvised and it's so funny. <laughs> that that's amazing. That's amazing. Um, I, I want to talk again about subverting your expectations with with certain with certain characters. So I want to talk about the villains. Uh Professor Ivo. 
known in the comics as the creator of Amazo, who has an android with the powers of the Justice League, which you obviously could not do in this cartoon because there is no <laughs> yes. Justice League. There's no Justice League, yeah. <laughs> and you merged him together with a parasite. So I yes. think that, um, you know, I think that uh, somebody like me who has been there for a long, who has been a Superman fan for a very long time and clearly not a writer would have been like, oh yeah, well, I would have never, it would have never occurred to somebody mm -hmm. like me. So like, what mm -hmm. is like, how did you guys come up with an idea for like doing that kind of thing or even changing the way Mixispitalik looked and all of that? Yeah. So, you know, a lot of this was, again, like the things that we loved about various characters. And for us with adapting it, knowing that we wanted to put our own spin and new spins on it was like, with each one, it's like, okay, what is the core of who this character is? And then how do we like make it fresh or different or new? And so, you know, for a lot of these villains, you know, we're tying it to the technology because that ties into our biggest change and reveal, which is Zero Day, what Zero Day is, where they got these weapons from begin with, which is they're all Kryptonian, spoiler. Uh, but for, uh, you know, Ivo, you know, we knew we wanted to do parasites um, and cause we love parasite, like we love the absorption powers is super cool. But like, we also like knew, like rather than sort of like Rudy Jones or some of the other parasites, Alex Alston, some of the other parasites you've seen before, like we kind of liked Ivo as a stand-in for that like mad science character that Superman often fights. Mm -hmm. um, and that uh, we like this idea of the parasite being not like a down in his luck guy who basically like won, won the world's worst lottery, but a guy whose entire deal is sucking the life out of things. Like he's a tech bro, like his company is entirely based on him making things that like it's it's that move fast break thing like he is the parasite um he's the one who's like i don't believe that a man would do this for the greater good of all um so like hitting that then we're like okay well like we know we're doing tech-based stuff so yeah he's built this suit it's a little bit like the amazo android but it's the suit that he wears uh and then we also knew that we wanted to be able to have this suit grow and get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger uh so that fight and that was an episode that me and Brendan wrote together and then Brendan uh, boarded that fight like I felt like oh, okay this is like the heart of who we are saying Parasite is which is this person who's like not just draining the energy from Superman but like doesn't believe anybody can give altruism like doesn't believe in giving energy out to the world and also he's using a fight with Superman to hawk his military grade weapons armor um for a character like Mrs. Mixus Pitalik um, you know, again, we're like, he's a trickster. He's a trickster god. Like, 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 like truly like he's this uh, fifth dimensional imp. That's always been his deal. But like, you know, for our universe, it makes sense for him to be a little bit more of that, like sort of like shitty DBZ space elf. Like there's like a little anime to him. He kind of fits into this world this way. Like I've always personally loved the version of Mixie where, you know, there is a multiverse, but there's one Mixie just changing what he looks like yes. as he goes through and ruins things. So like, I also like this part of the like, ah, it's every Clark, it's you, it's this one, it's this one. We're like, ah, that's fun. And then for us, again, we liked the idea of like putting all of his powers in that bowler hat, both as like a nod, but also here's a different way for us to do his powers and power set in a way that's fun and also incorporates in like, you know, the lore, but like puts a twist on it. So that was, I think, a very long way to say with all of these characters, it's, we're like, Mixie, he's the trickster who lives to basically make Superman miserable. Like Ivo, like makes the Amazo robot, but like kind of is like a terrible person and Parasite strains the life out of them. So we put them together, you know, like this is, we've got the core, now here's like the different pieces we can put together with that. I think it's a great upgrade to the parasite because I think my my issue with the parasite historically in the comics has always been that he's got such great power, but he's got no ambition whatsoever. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, you, and you know, like I love Rudy Jones and I love like I love the look of parasite. Uh, but we were very excited, uh, you know, with Ivo, he's got such a clear ambition, which is to beat the shit out of Superman. Uh, but like, you know, he's blaming Superman for his own mistakes, which is, a, a, again, a theme with all of our villains, which is blaming Superman for the things they did. <laughs> Harley Quinn uh, was famously incorporated into the comics after debuting on Batman, the animated series. Is there a character or reinvention of a character that you would like to see uh, have a legacy in the comics or in other media after the show is over? 
Oh man. Um, you know, I, you know, it's, it's funny. Cause it's like, man, like Harley Quinn is such like an amazing character and such an amazing character that the TV show got to make. And it's interesting because with Superman, like we do have that a little bit, like Jimmy Olsen was created for the radio show. He wasn't created, like there's like a blonde kid with a bow tie in like one of the first golden age comics who's like, gee whiz, Lois. But like they, they never name him. And then yeah, Jimmy Olsen, the name, the character, the photographer, that like the personality came from the radio show. Um, so for us, I mean, I, I, I love the trio of like our take on Lois Clark and Jimmy, like, again, I think mostly what we've been doing is just kind of reinventing characters rather than come bringing in new characters. Mm -hmm. But like, I really like, you know, I'm personally like kind of love the like, uh, uh, trio of dummies we've put together for intergang with rough house mist and, uh, silver banshee. Yeah. Like they're, they're very funny together. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, honestly, one of the things that I liked uh, the most that we did was sort of like our playing with like Ivo. Like if, you know, if this leads to an Ivo renaissance in the comics, that would be fun. <laughs> <laughs> My favorite story about all that is uh, Kryptonite was invented because the guy who was voicing Superman in the, in, on the radio show wanted to go on vacation. Yeah, yeah. And they're like, well, like, yeah, because it's like, well, when the shadow needs to go on vacation, we knock him out. They're like, yeah, but it's Superman. <laughs> 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 which i love i love so much <laughs> i love it so much it's such a practice see things are invented when because you need them <laughs> exactly <laughs> uh so another thing that i wanted to ask was about the, the the whole nature of krypton because as you've mentioned at the top of the show um we are so used to seeing superman seeing krypton immediately seeing everything explained to him right off the bat by his dad <laughs> yeah. And now, not only do you have a language barrier between yeah. the two of them, um, somehow this Jor-El didn't have a universal translator, mm -hmm. uh, you also are positioning Krypton to not be that great of a place. Uh, mm -hmm. So, like, where did that particular decision come about to just change all of that about Krypton change? Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, you know, I can't get too much into some of the some of the bigger Krypton stuff because, you know, we're I, we're you know, there's there's you know, I don't want to get into spoilers or any territory that could be construed as spoilers for season two. But I think for us, one of the big ideas and one of the big changes that we wanted to do, and again, like uh, you know, we talked about and Brendan Jacob talked about a lot, is this idea that like well, he shouldn't get a crystal explaining everything. Like if we if we kind of like, like this idea of this Clark is struggling with his identity and who am I and getting a crystal that's like, hello, you are Kal-El, this is what your destiny is. You're gonna raise them up, like kind of gets rid of that tension. Um, and so for us, it was really important. And we actually rewrote uh, this, the scenes where he gets his powers when he's a kid and the scenes where he sees the ship for the first time in episode two. We rewrote a lot and worked a lot and even we're finding new things in animatic as we were going because we knew it was so important and central to our story um but yeah that you know this the biggest difference is this clark doesn't know who he is and he doesn't have the explainer and so because of that it's all brand new to him and because it's brand new to him then bigger changes like finding out that zero day is this like insane invasion that like abruptly stopped because it seems like something was exploding behind them uh, is uh, then fresh to the audience too. We're experiencing it with Clark. Um, and then specifically with Jor-El, we talked a lot about, you know, and again, we talked a lot in the, the writer's room and with other people of like that experience of being the kid of like the immigrant experience and being an immigrant, being the kid of somebody who immigrated and there is a language barrier. Um, <clears throat> you know, like a, a lot of us have had like family members who immigrated to the United States who maybe never quite learned English. And there's always that little bit of like tension there of like, can I fully engage with them? What do I do? Um, and, you know, I, I had some people come up to me at Comic-Con this year and being like, I love it. Like I'm a transracial adoptee and I feel like this is exactly who I am and this is exactly my struggle. And so that was something, you know, Clark Kent, uh, Superman has always been an immigrant story and has always been an adoptee story. So we wanted to lean into that. And the way to do that for, for us at least was to lean into the fact that like, he's never, he doesn't really have the full scope and he's piecing it together and he doesn't quite have that connection to his culture or his background or his home. 
So it is all a struggle for him. How did you decide, uh, I mean, why did you decide not to use uh, Lex Luthor, Brainiac, and Zod in this, in this first season? Um, you know, some of it was, you know, like Warner Brothers, um, and I think it was, a, it was a good note, like our, our big execs and Warner Brothers were like, well, these are the big hitters that everybody's seen, and everybody's expecting, and like, a, like, we've seen this a million times, so like, we want, you know, we want your twists on things, and like, I think, and it was like, you know, like Sam Register, who was like, you know, and Audrey Deal, who are doing notes with us, were like, you know, these characters, like, kind of take take up the whole screen they kind of like suck the air out because they're so famous and there's so many expectations so hold off on them hold off on these characters and like build the story how you see fit um and so that's sort of like what we did was we were like okay like we're not going to have Lex Luthor we are you know uh not going to uh have the like brainiac stuff coming in we're going to start small we're going to smart start with like, you know, Clark is still learning his powers and figuring out who he is. So we're going to start small and start with some of these lesser known villains. We're going to start with some of these weirder villains. Uh, we're going to build up. And then we got to build up to, you know, General Lane, who is like a big Superman supporting character. Um, so everything that we're doing, we're doing because we want to both put its own stamp on it. Uh, but also because, you know, for us, especially in this first season, it was very important for us to grow to love Clark, Jimmy, and Lois and get invested in their relationship and get invested in who they are um, before we throw giant world spanning uh, characters who everybody has opinions on uh, into the yeah. mix. I, I think it's interesting because you do have a big time DC villain in there, which is, which is Deathstroke the Terminator. He's just not a <laughs> Superman villain. Yeah, yeah. So again, this was this was us being, you know, told to like stretch the limits, like don't don't uh, we don't want to see the same thing we've always seen. And, you know, some of that also is me being a Deathstroke fan and Brendan being a Deathstroke fan and Jake being a Deathstroke fan. Uh, and so, yeah, you know, and then it was like really fun, like, you know, finding their voices in that scene with like uh, Livewire and Deathstroke facing off against each other. Like it was really fun writing, doing that scene was very fun. So yeah, so, and you know, like uh, Deathstroke does uh, like, you know, we're, then we're also bringing in Amanda Waller who like is again, one of our favorite characters and she's teamed up with the general and here's our different version of Task Force X. And you can see, how it's slowly morphing into maybe closer to the version that we all know because now Amanda Waller's in charge. Uh, but yeah, with everything, it's like we wanted to subvert expectations. We wanted to pick things that were surprising and we wanted to like showcase different like characters and villains and things that like we thought would be fun to pair up with Superman, period. My, speaking of that, Mike Edson in the comments uh, reminds me that in one of my interviews with Mark Wade uh, about his, his series, World's Finest, he thinks about putting together uh, people who have never been put together. And one of the yeah. things that he mentioned in one of my interviews was Lois Lane and Vicki Vale. And you guys <laughs> beat him to the punch. <laughs> oh man, I didn't realize that. Yeah. <laughs> Amazing. Um, yeah. And um, in May of this year, a, a movie called Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse came out. And when it came out, I just wanted more multiverse animated multiverse stuff. Mm -hmm. And I did not expect that Lois Lane was gonna be the one to give it to me. <laughs> so Jake is the one who came up with the League of Lois Lanes. And uh, that was that was like the instant like he had said that and he had done this drawing of like all the Loises of different multiverses were like, hell yeah. Like, of course, Lois would have a, a council of Reed Richards. Like, our version of Lois is, like, such, such a go-getter. Of course, versions of Lois across the universe have come together. Like, obviously, that's our multiverse. <laughs> and why, what was the, um, you know, what was the thought process for trying to establish that your Lois Lane is the least accomplished Lois Lane thus far? <laughs> Although I'm assuming that there are other Lois Lanes that are not in the League of Lois Lanes that are probably less yeah. accomplished. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, because like, I think, again, this was like, what we saw was this was a chance to build on Lois's character. Like everything that we're doing, even when it's like picking characters that we love or villains that we love, like we're like, okay, something about this, like shines a light on who our characters are. 
So for the League of Lois Lanes, uh, you know, Lois is dealing with feelings of inadequacy. Like uh, she is, she cares, she's passionate, she wants to be a reporter. But, you know, we see in that fourth episode of like, she, you know, she's like, I can't tell dad I'm a screw up. And uh, you see in that final episode with General Lane, when like, you know, Martha Kent's like building Lois up and he's just like, well, that's what I expect. That's what lanes are. What are you doing with your life, Kent? Like, like Lois is somebody who part of the reason she's going after the truth so hard. And part of the reason she's trying to prove herself so hard is she does feel those inadequacies and she is vulnerable about that. So to be confronted with a league of yourself and all of them are better, like all of them are more like, like better than you. All of them like have gotten the Pulitzers. All of them have gotten promoted. All of them are already in this league. Like, of course that would exacerbate any insecurity she has and any doubt she has about herself and the people around her. Um, and then, you know, it was also very fun then to play on the expectations of like, who's the bad guy in this episode? Like, is it Mixie? Is it the League of Lois Lanes? The answer is kind of, they both are kind of amoral in terrible and different ways. Uh, but yeah, and then also by the end, it lets us show uh, what our Lois is good at, which is like, she's the one who helps come up with the plan to stop Mixie. It's not the Lois is shooting the guns. It's the Lois who works with Superman and works with Jimmy and plans it out so she can grab the hat off of him uh, when the portal's in the right spot. Uh, so, you know, Lois may think she's the worst Lois in the world, but for our show, she's the best Lois. She's great. I love her. Did, did you get any pushback from the network uh, mm -hmm. for, I'm just going to for the steaminess of some of the scenes? In the show? <laughs> no, not at all. Really? Uh, yeah, no, no. We, uh, you know, with all of this, we, we knew we're like, look, we love Lois and Clark equally. <laughs> like we like we're invested in both of them as romantic leads. So yeah, um, you know, uh, with the uh, the episode six where like Clark's shirt is just blown off for half the episode, or like you know those those kisses. Like it was it was you know we are like we're going for it. We're not holding back. This is what the story needs. And again, like it's been great because yeah, DC was on board. Warner Brothers was on board. Uh, and the response has been wonderful. Like to just see so many people like reacting to that, being like, oh, "Oh my goodness, Clark Kent!" But also like reacting to their relationship and liking yeah. liking that romantic tension. No, 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 kidding. Uh, I know somebody. I I told I was telling this person to watch the show, watch the show, watch the show. Mm -hmm. like, I'll get to it. I'll get to it. I'll get to it. And then that moment after he takes all of the bullets, like it goes yeah. viral. And she's like, all right, I'm going to go, I'm going to go watch it now. <laughs> uh, Mike Edson asks, how did you determine, guys, everyone else can ask a question. It doesn't just have to be Mike, okay? How did you Mike, you're really, you're really pulling it together here. <laughs> uh, how, how did you determine when Clark would discover new powers? I like how each new reveal seemed to line up with what he was dealing with thematically, which was great. Yeah. So, I mean, you, you've got half of it right there, which is like what he's dealing with thematically during that episode. Um, we basically knew we wanted to kind of slow roll out his powers because, you know, this version was not Superboy. He suppressed everything until right now. Um, so it makes sense that his powers are starting to finally like kick in and emerge because he's no longer suppressing them. Um, so for us, it was like the two criteria were uh, you know, does this sort of thematically fit like the episode and what we're doing? And then the other criteria uh, basically was, does he get a power in order to help somebody or save somebody? And that's, you know, uh, a big thing that happens throughout the season. You know, that very first time he unlocks super speed and super strength, it's because that mom is going to crash. Um, and for us, that's Clark. That's Superman. It's somebody who he has these powers, but like the powers aren't the point. The heart is the point. Like what he does with the powers is the point. So he is going to save the day. He is going to beat up like, you know, Kaiju, Parasite, Ivo, but he's going to do it because the whole city's come together. Um, and uh, in the last episode, we see a bunch of photos in the Kent household. Mm -hmm. One of them is a young Clark Kent with a young lady. Is that <laughs> Lana Lang? Guys, I can't say who... Well, who characters are if we have not confirmed characters in the show you're gonna have to keep watching <laughs> I, I, I will just ask them as uh, from one superman fan to another superman fan in the comics <laughs> and in various iterations mm -hmm. um superman and lois are married mm -hmm. and 
in your iteration, it is very clear. Superman and Lois are Endgame. Superman and Lois, you know, they they are Superman and Lois. Given that, uh, given that it has been cemented forever that it's going to be Superman and Lois, it doesn't have to be in your version. It can just be in general. Is there a place still for Lana Lang? Mm. Mm. Uh, look, I'm shocked that you're not like, where is Lori Lamaris in all of this? Where, when, when is our mermaid? I think there is in? always a place for a mermaid. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's so funny because like those comics where you've got Lana Lang, you've got Lori Lamaris coming in, you've got sort of like that, like love triangle stuff. It's so interesting because in, in the comics history, they're coming in during the silver age where like part of that was uh it is very rom com because like romance comedy comics were huge like the number one comic being like the number one comics being sold during a good chunk of the 60s were romance comics they weren't superhero comics like romance comics and teen comics uh that uh for teenagers were like selling like hotcakes so yeah. like part of that was this love triangle was getting in on that was like being like bringing in some of these like romance elements and then you know later like marvel brought in literal romance like artists to work on spider-man to work on yes. very exactly like that so you know it is very rom com -y. um and so you know like lois and clark are you know like end game in the comics like you know they've got a son who's rapidly growing uh and uh you know, I would be some years. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He had some super trauma. He skipped some years. He's he's going out there. He's trying to be giving it his all. Um, but like I, you know, in the comics, I would love to see, you know, it's hard because it's like you want to have your cake and eat it too. It's like I love Lois and Clark as a couple. I love them so much. And this is me specifically talking about seeing in the comics rather than anything else. Um, and you know that the Superman and Lois TV show is great. It's so fun. It's lovely. It scratches this like fun itch of like, what if like, here's the whole family. Uh, but I would love to see DC like do like an Elseworlds story or like an Elseworlds miniseries or like some sort of ultimates where you get to have that fun still. Cause like, you know, part of the joy of this series was us getting to write Lois, Lois and Clark falling in love um, and navigating their relationship. And, you know, there's still going to be ups and downs, like it's not all going to be smooth sailing, um, but like, you know, it, it is it is fun. It is fun to write a relationship in its early stages. It's fun to write crushes. So, yeah, I would I would say I think in the comics, I'd love to see DC embrace an Elseworld story or a miniseries or something that like, you know, they can keep their main continuity, but like you can give a little something for other people. <laughs> I'm just going. I'm just going to say, and I know you can't confirm anything. I, I hope. I just want to say that eventually in your show, I really would like to see some mermaids. And anyway, my last question. Um, well, my second to last question. Actually, this is not a question. Uh, yeah. I just want to say that in the last decade or so, uh, there's been an influx of evil supermen, uh, really mm -hmm. grim and gritty supermen, uh, and you touch on that. Uh, with the multiversal Superman, it is yeah. so nice to see a Superman who just wants to help people again. I, oh, thanks. I mean, you know, like, and again, like, I, I think we've said this in other interviews, like, we feel like we're that meme of like, don't make me tap the sign and the sign is we love all Superman. But like, it's, it is like, you know, because, you know, it's been so long since we've had sort of like the big blue boy scout it's been fun for us to bring him back, really. It's been fun for us to play with that idea. And, you know, like we, like we, you said, we touched on it in the multiverse episode, which is like, you know, our version of Superman is one of a multiverse. There's mm -hmm. multiple different versions. Like probably in this, our universe is sitting side by side with Man of Steel. It's sitting side by side with Injustice. It's sitting side by side with other things. Uh, but because it is its own kind of universe bubbled off from everybody else. This is the story that we get to tell. These are the these are the things that we get to exemplify. And again, for us, uh, you know, growing up, like watching the Christopher Reeve movie, watching Superman, the animated series, or like Superman for us is a beacon of hope. And yes. it's fun to play him that way. Um, and, you know, it's also then fun uh, to, you know, finish recording an episode with Jack Quaid that's all about, you know, he's like, you know, crying and he's telling Lois he loves her and the city's saving him and then go home and then watch the boys and be like, wow, this is very different. <laughs> like, it's fun that all of these exist. <laughs> uh, we've, uh, my, my girlfriend and I have been reading out loud some of the really old comics and a week before this cartoon debuted, we read the first appearance of Superman. 
Mm. And which, and she was like, well, these are two completely different characters. Yeah. Because <laughs> Superman's changed a lot <laughs> in, in the 85 years. <laughs> the octogenarian is still changing. <laughs> and and um, so I think, uh, thank you for that. Uh, my last question for you is this. I interviewed you a year ago for Shazam. Yep. And in that interview, you talked about Shazam, Sailor Moon, Shira, et cetera. And you said the words, everyone deserves a magical transformation sequence. <laughs> it takes cartoons a long time to make. <laughs> How much did you just really want to say <laughs> that you were going to give Superman? <laughs> amazing a magical yeah. transformation sequence <laughs> it's just it's just a firmly held belief that everybody should get a magical girl transformation sequence i mean i think the funny thing is and again i've, I've said this in other interviews like i give full credit to like diana who and uh hugh and uh jessica zamet who boarded that sequence because like you know we talked about like okay and then he gets his suit and like maybe we can do some sort of transformation thing and they went all out and we're like hell yeah it's in the show <laughs> go for it uh, so yeah, so it's just it, my, it's my it's my campaign platform. It's my it's 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 my deeply held belief that everybody should get a magical girl transformation, and uh, we were able to do it. <laughs> Ms. Josie Campbell, thank you so much. This was great. Uh, congratulations on season thank two. You. Congratulations on season one. Thank it's you. An, it's an amazing show. Thank you so much. Thank you.